those um, who follow me on Twitter may have noticed that I had a little problem coming up with a presentation for today, a uh, topic of a presentation. This is all to do, I think, with the fact that the focus of my work is really on uh, scholarly communication in the networked environment. And although I try to stay uh, up to date on developments in uh, cultural heritage, I don't really directly uh, contribute. So here I was kind of pondering what I'm going to talk about. And then I noticed that they had given uh, this session the title of Future Note, which I actually really don't know what that means, but I thought, well, this is an open door. I'm going to do a Future Note about the past. And it's not about my past, it's about uh, the web of the past. And it's um, really a story that starts uh, around 2009, when um, my colleagues uh, Michael Nelson, uh, Rob Sanderson and I uh, came up with the idea of a memento, uh, a protocol to time travel uh, the web. And interesting enough, uh, that whole moment, uh, coming up with the protocol uh, to do so, uh, has dominated uh, an entire decade of uh, my career. And so I have been basically obsessed with the whole notion of uh, temporal aspects of the web, uh, persistence of the web, persistence of links, persistence of resources, and so on. So I'm going to take you through a story of 10 years of uh, one idea leading to another, insights gained, and I hope I kind of put it all together in a somehow accessible manner, uh, so that from a cultural heritage perspective, you'll also uh, will, uh, be able to take uh, something home. So Memento is a, a protocol, it's specified in an uh, RFC, and I think it uh, squarely fits into what Rob referred to as a don't break the web protocol. So it's completely restful, it's based on all uh, the primitives of the architecture of the web. It's a specification, in my opinion, uh, done right. So it introduces uh, the notion of time to the web. Basically the notion that um, you can interact with a resource on the web and basically express a preference for not seeing its current representation. You basically say, I'm not interested at all in what you look like today. I want to know what you looked like sometime in the past. And you express uh, the time in the past. And so uh, may I first ask a show of hands of who knows about the Memento Protocol? Of course, Rob, you do. <laughs> okay. So anyhow, there's a lot of people that haven't uh, heard about it, it seems. So I'm going to uh, briefly explain. I, I won't uh, take too long on this. So how, how did we actually achieve this? Uh, the ability to move using the HTTP protocol from the present to the past and also back from the past uh, to the present. So what we see here is, uh, at the left-hand side, is a resource as it exists uh, on the current web. Uh, it happens to be uh, the CNN homepage, let's say. We call that the original resource. And at the right-hand side, you see snapshots uh, of that resource in a web archive, in this case, in the Internet Archive, and we call these things uh, mementos. So what we want to achieve is uh, a client, like a browser or so, uh, comes into resource R and wants to say, nope, I don't want to see you the way you look today, I want to see you the way you looked at some time, you know, uh, at a specific uh, moment in the past. Now, the problem in doing this is that, in this case, CNN has no clue whatsoever of the specific URIs of these snapshots in the Internet Archive. It just doesn't, because it's being grabbed without really knowing it. But, like all big problems in computer science, we're going to solve it with a level of indirection. And the insight is, we're going to say, oh, well, okay, CNN, in this case, doesn't know these specific URIs, but it may know that the Internet Archive has snap snapshots of my past. And that's a piece of information that we're going to use. And the way we do that is by introducing a new resource, which lives at the end of the Internet Archive in this picture, which we call a time gate, because it's going to give access to the past of that resource. And so it's a new resource that didn't exist prior to the Memento Protocol that has all the information about prior versions of CNN.com, in this case, in the Internet Archive. 
So what happens now is a client comes into CNN, looks at the headers of this resource. This is not a link, by the way, uh, that you put in HTML. This is a link at the level of the HTTP headers. And it's called the time gate link. And so this, resource, this uh, client comes in and says, no, I don't want to see you the way you look today. I'm going to follow that time gate link because the time gate knows about uh, your past. Once it's there, we now are at the level of a resource that knows everything about the past of the CNN resource. And now we're going to use another primitive of uh, web technologies. We're going to use content negotiation, but we're doing it in the time dimension, in the daytime dimension. So content negotiation is built into the web. It's typically used to express, I would like to see the English version rather than the French version, or give me that character set rather than that. But here, we use it in a new dimension, namely time. So the client now talks to this time gate and says, well, I'm interested in time i or time j, and the client will be redirected by the time gate to the resource that is appropriate for uh, the requested time. Obviously, these are approximations because we don't have snapshots for all resources at any moment in time. Okay. So this is the bridge from the present to the past. The other way around is very simple. Because these resources in the Internet Archive know what they are snapshots of. They are snapshots of CNN.com. So they can easily, using the same HTTP link mechanism, link back to the original resource. So now we basically have a way to go from the present to the past and from the past back to the present. Of course, we can also stay in the past by continuously negotiating with resources in the daytime uh, dimension. Did you get this? Okay, I got someone at least who got it. <laughs> this is important because I will uh, obviously uh, build on this. So I'm going to dwell a tiny bit more uh, on something that is important for uh, this presentation. It is, I explained everything in terms of um, CNN.com and the Internet Archive. But you can, of course, also use the Memento Protocol in versioning systems that hold on to their own version history, like wikis, content management systems, and so on. And in that case, the original resource, the time gate, and the mementos are all in the same kind of system. And that basically means that what Memento does here is it allows distributed management of resource history, and it allows clients to uniformly interact with versions of resources, temporal versions, across systems. So this is interoperability for access to temporal versions of resources. This also means that if you have a certain version resource in system A, and system A links to system B, you can now, if this also supports Memento, you can basically traverse that link subject to time. So you basically are navigating continuously in the past. That's, of course, if these systems uh, support uh, the protocol. And then another aspect here is that in many cases on the web, there is no such uh, time gate link, in which case we go back to client intelligence. And the client now decides, I'm going to use the time gate that I know about. And typically, that would be the time gate at the Internet Archive, because that's by far the biggest web archive in the world. But research has found that in the other web archives that are out there, there are also a lot of unique copies of materials. And so you kind of want to include these. And we have done that by many years ago, actually, introducing an aggregator that goes across many different web archives. So a client can now say, oh, I'll choose the time gate of this aggregator. And by using the aggregator, now has a perspective on all the snapshots that are available in web archives worldwide. So sticking with that for just a moment, initially when we built this aggregator, there were about 10 web archives that we covered. Now we are over 20, we're around 25. And of course, you understand that you run into a distributed systems problem. People that have worked with Z39.50, SRU, and so on, know that there's a limit to how many 
polls you can do to distribute uh, content bases. And so we, of course, ran into exactly the same problem. So response times got out of control. We were putting load on distributed archives that typically didn't even have a snapshot for the resource that we were looking for. And so we tried uh, to come up with uh, solutions uh, for this problem and came across literature whereby people had, purely on the basis of features of a URI, done classification of, oh, this looks like a spam URI, or this is a phishing URI, purely looking at, you know, how deep is the path, uh, what are the contents, uh, elements, and so on. We used this as inspiration, and we said, oh, here's a wild idea. What if we could just look at the URI? look at its features and decide on the basis of that kind of information whether we should look into archive A, B, C, and so on to see whether they have copies. I didn't mean this, this is a machine learning uh, approach, of course, right? So we trained binary classifiers uh, based on our cache data uh, for a whole bunch of URIs, and we found that this actually really worked. I mean, we were astonished. This experiment, as uh, dates back from 2016, and it's been in production ever since. So we cover now about 23, uh, 23 uh, web archives. We have 80% reduction in the number of queries, third reduction in response time, and we still have a recall of about 85%. Why do I tell you about this? Well, this is a distributed systems problem. We talked a lot about decentralization. You're going to do uh, services in the decentralized manner. You're always going to run into issues like this. This is very uh, similar to the source selection problem in uh, linked data, you know, which Sparkle endpoints to query, for example. And here, we found a solution based on machine learning, but we also had to give in a little bit. We don't have 100%. We have 85%. And I think that's kind of the story that if you're going to decentralize, you're always going to lose a bit, but you're going to win an awful lot also. All right. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, Memento tools. There's plugins for uh, the two main browsers, and you can find more information about the tools there. Uh, most all public web archives in the world uh, support the protocol now. So basically, you can serve the web like it's 1999. This whole idea, by the way, I maybe need to explain the tree uh, team that's going on here. Uh, those trees are uh, bristle cone pines. You find them in uh, the US on the West Coast and uh, in the Southwest. They're um, very persistent uh, little trees, very sturdy. The oldest uh, specimen is over 5,000 years old. So here you see a grove of uh, bristle cone pines, meaning a pocket of uh, persistence. So this whole notion of memento and being able to uh, travel in time brought me to this uh, question that Ingrid already posed there. How can we, or how could we, faithfully uh, navigate uh, the web uh, of the past. And there's really two main forces, actually I'll talk about the third one towards the end of my presentation, but two main forces that go against trying to achieve this. One you know very well, that's link rot. It's a link that breaks, so the content at the end of the link just goes away. Another phenomenon is actually less well known, it's content drift, and it means that the content to which is being linked changes over time, maybe at times to change so dramatically that it has nothing to do anymore with the originally uh, linked uh, content. So let me uh, further explain. This is how you typically see you know, what a link is. Well, this is false because time is at play in all of this. So a link from A to B is subject uh, to time. And link rot is all about at time zero the link leads to a representation of B at time zero, and then at a certain moment, B is gone, and the link leads to nothing anymore. I don't need to explain that to you. Uh, you're all very familiar with it. Uh, we did in the Hyperlink project a large-scale study actually of link rot for scholarly communication. So we took uh, various uh, large scientific corpora, and here you see uh, information about PubMed Central, 
So we took all of PubMed Central in this case and extracted all the URIs in the scientific papers and put them in two categories, links to other papers and links to the web at large. We weren't interested in links to papers because those are under control of DOIs and all, and we thought that all those links would be okay. That's another story, by the way. But here, uh, this is about links to the web at large, so this links to slides, this links to software, you know, things like that. And here, uh, the results that you see here are in function of um, uh, the date of publication in which the reference URI was found. And obviously, no surprise, the, the study was done in 2014. No surprise that for stuff that's published in 1997, you have 80% link rot, right? Uh, go back, though. Uh, in 2012, so two years before the study, you already have about 20% uh, link rod, meaning that by today, if you look at the 40, etc., something percent for things that are seven years old, we would now already be at the level of 40, 50 or so percent of link rod for all those links in scholarly papers that point to the web at large. So a known problem, but a very serious problem from the perspective of scholarly communication, at least. Now, content, content drift is an all different matter. So again, at a certain moment when an author, let's say, puts a link into uh, to, uh, a web at large uh, resource, it has this representation, but now the content is starting to change. And so eventually, maybe, the representation at time Q, when the reader follow this link, for example, has nothing to do anymore with what it used to be. And so here's an example. You see uh, a screenshot, I mean uh, a memento really, out of the uh, Internet Archive for the same resource with just three months in between. So one taken in May 2009, the other August uh, 2009. And obviously you see that the layout has changed, but from here I can also see that the content has changed very dramatically. So that's content drift uh, at work. There's, of course, also cases where there is no content drift uh, whatsoever. And this was the most extreme example we found. So this is a snapshot from 1997. And then when we dereferenced that URL on the live web in 2016, not a single byte has changed. This is physics. <laughs> so we also did a study to assess the extent of content drift. Uh, we used actually very neat methodology, read the paper if you're interested, but the challenge really was finding out, finding in web archives around the world, a snapshot of a reference resource that was representative of what the resource was like when the author put the link in, in the first place. Interesting challenge, but we actually tackled it. Once we had that resource, we could then also, of course, dereference the URI on the live web and compare the snapshot with the live web resource. And so we did that by uh, text analysis, so textual comparison using uh, a variety of text similarity uh, measures. And so the short of the story here, again, this is in function of publication here, the short of the story here is that the darker the color, the worse the news. So black is link rot. And then the only good news is on the very top, the white stuff, that means that percentage of resources has not changed since the author put the link to the resource in place. So, you know, go back to 2003, and there's hardly like 5% of resources that have not drifted away from what the author uh, originally linked to. 2012, and this study is 2016, about 20% of resources that have not changed. So in case you would think that content drift is not a serious matter, this uh, picture actually shows uh, that it is. So going back to what would it take to support faithfully navigating the web of the past? Well, clearly for the whole web, we cannot solve this problem. We see it uh, on the live web, but there are communities that may actually or should actually care about addressing this problem, and that includes scholarly communication, that probably includes cultural heritage, definitely legal publications, journalism, Wikipedia, uh, things like that. Why is that? Well, Linkrod 
they clearly cannot stand when they link from out there collection to other environments, it's a quality of service thing. You really don't want your end user to be facing uh, a dead link. Content drift. There, the motivations may vary from community co uh, to community. In the case of scholarly communication, where my focus is, it's really about the integrity of the scholarly record. The ability to revisit the scholarly record in the way it was supposed to be, not in the way that it somehow evolved out of control of an author. When it comes to legal stuff, it's about reliable evidence. Uh, in Wikipedia, for example, a lot is about transparency of editorial process, so you would like to see that, but it's also, generally speaking, about being able to revisit the state of knowledge as it was at a certain moment in time. So I'm going to explore with you this whole notion of what can custodians of managed collections do to avoid link rot, to avoid content drift, to allow the emergence of these kind of pockets of persistence. And I'm going to distinguish between two types of links. On the one hand, links from one managed collection to another managed collection, so let's say between two cultural heritage collections, and then on the other hand, from a managed collection to the web at large. So, you know, just anything out there where you kind of don't know who's in charge of uh, what you link to. Those are the two things, themes that I'm going to explore. And the first exploration is going to be about persistent identifiers and how these uh, play a role in here. And with persistent identifiers in this case, I mean things like uh, DOIs, handles, pearls, you know, that are based on uh, redirection uh, of uh, your eyes. So I don't think I need to tell you an awful lot uh, about this. Uh, because you're very much aware of uh, how these things work. But still, a summary. In the case of persistent identifiers, basically you're minting a new URI for an existing URI. And rather than linking from A to B, you're going to link from A to the persistent identifier, and then the persistent identifier infrastructure will redirect you to the current location of the content B. Obviously, when the content B changes from location B to C, then the redirection table is updated by the custodian of B, and then the redirection happens not to B, but uh, to C. So link rot is solved in this way. Content drift is less a technical than a policy issue. For example, uh, with DOIs, the policy is that once you have a substantially new version of a piece of content, you must mint a new PID, and hence the first story goes over and over again. So now for each of these versions, over time, for example, you mint a new PID and you're in exactly the same situation. So what you really do with PIDs is you pretend that the web of the past and the web of the present are the same. You kind of hard code that using uh, persistent identifiers. Now this one is interesting, I find, because it, it was actually a new perspective for me to look uh, at this stuff. This is about dependencies in this whole uh, solution. The insight here is that the custodian of A fully relies on the custodian of B, meaning the resource that is being linked to, to keep these links persistent, right? It is the custodian of B that requests the PIDs, that updates the correspondency table at the uh, PID infrastructure, creates new versions, and so on. And so the only thing that the custodian of A really has to do is use the PIDs. So clearly, when you look at the balance here, it is between A and B, it is B that is doing all the work in order to keep the link from A to B going, which I found kind of a remarkable insight. I've been working on this stuff for a long time, and just you know, a year or so ago I said, well, that's kind of bizarre, because this one wants good service, but this one is going to do all the work so that this one can deliver uh, good service. Now, Here's an interesting one. Remember I said the only thing that A needs to do is actually use the PID? <laughs> 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 
So this, is, this comes out of the same study that I referred to. And again, this is about P, uh, PNC. So what we thought, and Rob uh, was on my team at that moment, what we thought is, well, it's going to be easy to divide between links to scholarly papers and links to the web at large. Because the links to scholarly papers will all be DOI links. And then we, we did that, and we started eyeballing the result of that activity, and we saw an awful lot of links that went to, like, uh, uh, Springer.com, Elsevier.something, et cetera, et cetera. Meaning, people had used the landing page URIs, and the publishers, with all their added value in the editorial process, had not updated these landing URIs to the actual PIDs. Astonishing. For PMC, we found that more URIs were linking to papers not using the PIDs than using the PIDs. So, little caveat for persistent identifier solutions. You don't believe me, I see it. <laughs> it's actually really true, though. So, we did managed collection to managed collection for persistent identifiers. Now we go to web at large, where this is done with very quickly. I told you how much work the custodian of B has to do in order to make that solution work. In this case, there's no one home. There's no one that you can rely on. You do not trust that party. So the PID solution does not work in this case. So here are summary of the PID approach. Now we go to another approach that comes out of the hyperlink work also, and we call it the robust link approach. And here I'm going to first look at the whole notion of links to the web at large. Okay? So from a managed collection to the web at large. So web at large, again, that means we have no one home there. We can call no one, we can rely on no one. This is an interesting situation because the the problem that the custodian of A faces when linking to B is that it has no information at all about the potential future of B. B can vanish, B can drift, you don't know anything, but you still want to link to it. So the only way, the only thing that you can really do in order to allow your users in the future to see what it was that you linked to is to create a snapshot of what you linked to. And that's that little memento that you see up there. It's really the only thing you can do. And now the question becomes, so what are we going to link to now? Well, it's of course very tempting now that you created that snapshot to actually go link to the snapshot. I mean, it's pure intuition. I'm going to link to the snapshot. There's a little problem with that, actually. And this is a major insight from uh, the Hyperlink project. Well, first of all, you, you can't visit the original resource anymore because you've taken away its URL. And in many cases, you could still want to actually try to do that traversal. But the other one is that if you link to the snapshot, then you potentially introduce a new link rot problem because you're really not sure that the archive in which the snapshot was created is going to persist over time. Right? So you replace potentially one link rot problem with another. Just in order to illustrate that, because I see sceptical looks again in the audience, the business model of web archiving is totally unclear. And there have been commercial attempts like this one here, Mummify It, it was called. And they basically offered the subscription service. So you could basically make your own snapshots, and they would be in your own environment. Well, the only thing that remains of Mummify.it is this snapshot in the Internet Archive. <laughs> in many cases, especially the Internet Archive, but also some other web archives are blocked in countries like Russia, uh, China, uh, India, soon the US, of course, right? Because there's content available there that the governments don't particularly like. So it means that if you live in any of these regions and a link was put in place to the snapshot in the Internet Archive, for example, you're out of luck. And then, of course, web archives are just operational systems that can go down every now and then just because of technical reasons. So 
All this to illustrate that not a good idea to actually link to the snapshot. And this is where the notion of decorate the links uh, comes in. So rather than just linking to the snapshot, we're going to, in this case, use target attributes that you use in HTML5 to also convey the original URL and the daytime of the snapshot, meaning the daytime uh, of linking. Another version uh, down there that puts the focus more on linking to the original resource and at the same time linking to the snapshot. This is really interesting because this gives you a uh, strong fallback mechanism. One moment. First, I need to say that once you have these decorations sitting in HTML pages, you can obviously make them operational using very simple JavaScript. If you're interested, I wrote the paper with Michael Nelson in DLib magazine, where basically every single of these links is decorated and has snapshots in uh, web archives uh, corresponding uh, with them. So this is what you gain, really, with uh, robust links. So remember, we were linking from A to B, and we had created that snapshot. And what you really have is three types of links in one. So we have the link to the snapshot. We also have the link to the original URL. And if you listen carefully earlier on with the Mento and the TimeGate stuff and all, I can use the original URL and the daytime of linking to go look up stuff in other web archives in case the web archive that has this snapshot goes out of business. So I have an optimal uh, fallback mechanism to access these old copies, even over time, even if all these things go away, I can still use the original URIB and the date of linking to find something in web archives around the world. That's what I call persistence. So here, now we have the other side of the metal. In this case, what we have is that when you link from a managed collection to the web at large, it's the custodian of the managed collection that has to do all the work. Because again, there's no one at home to do any work there. So it's this one who requests a snapshot, who decorates the links, and so on. So clearly, in this case, all the work, well, when comparing A and B, the work clearly is at the end of A. So now I'm going to see whether this notion of link decoration, robust links, applies also or could apply to links from a managed collection to a managed collection. And of course, the answer is yes, because otherwise uh, I wouldn't uh, bring it up. So here we are now in the world not of persistent identifiers, but of cool your eyes that don't uh, change. Right? And so, in case they do change, well, then you basically redirect from B to C. You have to hold on to the domain B, of course, because otherwise uh, this is not going to work. And in order to uh, tackle the issue, uh, that's to tackle the link rot, of course, in order to tackle uh, content drift, we deal with this whole notion of what we call uh, generic URIs and version URIs, used a lot like in specifications in the W3C and so on, where the current version of a resource is at any moment in time available at the generic URI, but for each version there also exists a time-specific uh, URI. So here again, we can use exactly this link decoration mechanism to link to the specific uh, version URI, the generic URI, and again, to convey this information about daytime and original URI, which could lead us to resources in web archives. Okay? So here we are now again in the situation where we've been linking to another managed collection. And again, in this case, all the work is at the end of the resource that is being uh, linked to. Like this. So here we are. Robust links, of course, works in all cases. And that's the summary of this entire uh, little uh, discourse. Right? So PIDs work in the case from managed to manage. For all cases of managed to manage, the work is really done by the custodian of B. Web at large, PIDs don't work. The robust link approach works, but it's always the custodian of A that works. So this is really a way, in my opinion, the robust links approach 
and of course using version management of resources, a way to establish those pockets uh, of persistence. I'm going to have to skip this because I saw that Ingrid just gave me the 10 minute sign and there's something I really want to show you, okay? So I'm going to skip a whole, I already like deleted 15 slides just before starting and I still have too much stuff, okay? Anyhow, uh, I was going to, on this slide, which I'm not going to talk about, give you a little categorization uh, of systems that allow you to deal with versions or with snapshots and their different characteristics and how they can all support Memento and how the world could be so nice and we could travel in time in these pockets of persistence. But I have something very new for you that I really want to share. And I need to, okay. I said there was a third aspect that keeps us from faithfully revisiting the web of the past. And this is the challenges one has in actually creating faithful captures of web resources. Especially when you use web archiving techniques, it's very hard, or getting harder and harder, to create faithful uh, snapshots of things. So when you use web crawling, like the Internet Archive and most web archives actually, these techniques that you use are really optimized for scale. And when these crawlers come across pages that have a lot of interactive affordances, let's just say complicated JavaScript, then they do a very bad job of capturing the stuff. At the other end of the spectrum is WebRecorder.io. Have you heard of uh, WebRecorder.io? It's a very, very neat tool for personal web archiving. And what this really does is, a user is recording an entire session. It's almost like you create a screen cam, only it's not a screen cam. You're really storing all the res resource representations, putting them together in a work file. And then you can revisit that capture in a very faithful manner. That is, of course, not used to archive at scale because it requires all that manual intervention. Some people may have heard of logs. They do things specific for uh, journal articles, uh, archiving, and so on. And they have this notion of using portal-specific heuristics that tell them where's the PDF, where's the metadata, and so on, and so on. So we have started this project two, three months ago. It's called Memento Tracer, and it tries to find a new sweet spot in capturing resources at scale and with high quality. And like web crawling, it uses server-side techniques you know, to capture the resources. Like logs, it uses the insight that resources on a certain portal typically have the same kind of layout, same kind of affordances, and so on. So there's classes of resources out there that share the notion of specific affordances. Like web recorder I.O., we're going to have a human in the loop, but in contrast to Web Recorder I.O., where the user is literally time and again recording an entire uh, session, here we're going to record information at an abstract level. So we have a browser plugin that is actually listening, so it uses a browser event listener, and it is listening to the interaction that the person does with a, a sample page of a certain class of pages. And the user, which is a curator in this case, is clicking in order to get everything that needs to be archived. And that information is recorded not at the level of specific URIs, it's recorded at the level of which kind of functions are being used, and at which level in the DOM representation am I. So it's at an abstract level. And I'm actually going to show you, this is a bit uh, technical here, but this is an interaction with a SlideShare page. And it says for all pages with the URI slideshare.something, these two actions need to be fulfilled. And the first one is a repeated click on the next slide button. This is something that you can never do with web crawling. And you see here that this is recorded at an abstract level. There's no URIs here. It says, I use a CSS selector, and the action is repeat click until the URL changes. Okay? And then the second one uh, is also CSS selector, and this basically says, 
you know, there is a box under the presentation in SlideShare that has the speaker notes. This says every single URI in there, click it. This is at the level of total abstraction. So this means that if I train once on the SlideShare page, so there's a human here that does this on the SlideShare page, then later on I can use this at an industrial scale to capture pages of the same class in this exact manner. So we found this new sweet spot, really, between capturing at scale and capturing in quality. This is experimental work, but it looks actually very promising. I had two QuickTime movies ready to show you that it really does work, but I guess I don't have time anymore. So if you're interested, come see me, and I thank you a lot for your attention.